This episode is on a subject that I am very passionate about. And that subject is getting your horse on the bit. Except I'm not really passionate about it. I'm passionate about not doing that. Or at least not saying that phrase. So that phrase, get your horse on the bit, has been the source of so much confusion and frustration and discomfort for many a horse and rider. Now, I've met students who dreamed of learning dressage only to have their first lesson be a teacher yelling, shorten your reins, get your horse on the bit for an hour. <laughs> and then they and their horse go home feeling terrible about each other. And then they don't want to do dressage again. And that's a shame because there's some beautiful things in dressage and it's really fun to do. I love it. Now, did you know that it's not unusual for many students and riders to have to ice their hands after riding dressage? Because so much of the focus is on taking contact. And it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't have to be that way. So I'll explain why that term, get your horse on the bit, is so unhelpful. And I'll give you another way to think about it. So here we go, episode four, stop trying to get your horse on the bleeping bit. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. Stop trying to get your horse on the bleeping bit. That phrase, get your horse on the bit, has caused so so much undue pain and suffering for horses and riders. A student shows up for a lesson with their beautiful horse, dreaming of feeling the grace and the power that they've envisioned. And in their first lesson, it's all about shorten your reins, get them on the bit, take the contact, and the struggle begins. Why does the bit have to be the starting point of all dressage? You know, often to be seen riding a horse who is quote, come off the bit, is a gasp-worthy crime in many dressage barns. And students are led to believe that if they can just get their horse's neck and head in that particular round shape, then that means that they're doing dressage. That's what dressage is. You put your horse's head down. It's not how dressage really works. The trouble is, Saying, get your horse on the bit, single-handedly puts all of the rider's attention on exactly the wrong end of the horse. And it causes most riders to activate their hands. And activating their hands in a way that's going to take monstrous amounts of neural reprogramming to stop doing later. Right? So we, we want to be riding from our seat. I think we all know we want to be riding from our seat. We want our horses to be going forward to the bit. But human brains are very hand dominant. So if you give a very strong suggestion to do something with taking contact and that our reins are in our hands, it's going to, it's our, our human hands are going to grab. It's what we do. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why it's just a horrible phrase. It also creates a dynamic in the horse that actively prevents him from actually achieving the biomechanics that we're all aiming for. So let me just say now, I know that it's just a term, right? It's just a phrase meant to um, describe a dynamic that's going on. And when someone is really properly educated, one realizes that it's just a description of an end result. So in the end, when things are going well, when the horse 
as a product of his balance and energy and his trust in the rider's hands, reaches forward and initiates the contact with the bit, thus completing the circuit of energy, the experienced and artful rider, rider will say, it feels like my horse is on the bit or my horse is reaching into the contact. My horse is taking my hands forward, right? So that feeling of the horse reaching forward into a trustworthy contact as a result of their balance and the free flowing of that circuit of energy now has turned into, well, let's just make that happen, right? So there's this, all this artful stuff that needs to happen to create a circumstance, which when it's happening, often can feel like your horse has gotten on the bit, but you can't get to it by just trying to take the shortcut. You can't just get the horse on the bit. The horse has to arrive there. And that's one of the things that makes dressage riding so challenging. So it's, it's impossible to give and take at the same time, right? So when you tell hands, human hands, to get something, they are going to take it, right? So get your horse on the bit. Riders are going to naturally short shortcut. They're going to close their hands. And it also means that if you, the hands are taking, then the horse has to give, right? So if the hands are taking and the horse is taking, now everybody's leaning and that sets up the circumstance where, um, for example, I've had several students who've come to me and they say that it's typical that they would have to put ice on their hands after riding dressage. So that's what happens when hands take and horses take. So if the hands are taking, then the horse has to give. And how can the horse end up reaching into the contact if they're having to give at the same time? It, it doesn't make sense, <laughs> you know? So the reality is the term get your horse on the bit is a terrible term. It causes uneducated students to use their hands in an attempt to take dominant control over the horse's head, neck, and jaw, you know, so that the neck goes into round shape. And I really believe words matter. So let's look at a different way of thinking about it. In my mind, the neck of the horse and the shape of the neck is, is the last thing that comes. It's the last part that I really pay attention to. And here's why. The head and neck of the horse uh, is the most flexible and most sensitive part of the whole horse's body. So this means that mistakes here uh, can easily cause defensive behaviors and postures, which are gonna work against the posture we're trying to create. Um, it also means that it's possible for the neck to disconnect from the rest of the body. So if you can imagine, it's possible to have a horse with a really tight, flat back. And you can still, because the neck is so flexible, it's possible to create a round shape in the neck and the head of the horse. But now you've disconnected. So yay, your horse's neck is round, but because the back is not round, you've actually created a disconnect. And in dressage, we're trying to constantly create a free flowing um, of energy in a, you know, this circuit of energy, the circuit of energy shouldn't have little zigzags, <laughs> zigzags and, and stopping points in it. And every time there's a disconnect or there's a lack of free flowing, I, I think of it in my mind, it feels, and I, my visualization is like there's a rock in the river, right? So if, if you have a horse who's not feeling like the neck is offering to be round, I don't go to the neck first. I start looking at other parts of the body. So the head and neck are also a reflection of the state of the whole horse. So body and mind, right? So a horse that's scared, <laughs> that neck is going to go up, you know, and the nose might come out. Um, a horse that's really bored or um, 
feeling, um, yeah, bored. <laughs> we'll just go that, you know, think of that posture. What do you look like when you're bored, right? So it's a little bit of a deflated posture. Um, if the horse is, is not trusting, they're going to be in a braced or defensive posture. Um, so again, if the neck is not in a beautiful, harmonious, arched, <laughs> athletic, you know, place, um, it's more of a symptom, not necessarily the core of the problem. So if we don't over manipulate the neck, it actually becomes a really excellent indicator of the balance of the horse and how the horse is really going. So when a horse is relaxed and energized and balanced um, in a way with, with no reason for resistance, then the whole body including the neck, will start to naturally take on a round shape. Um, this can happen with a bit, without a bit, with a rider, or without a rider. As riders, we need to set up this circumstance in our horse's body and mind, and then we need to be balanced and trustworthy with educated enough hands to connect with our horse in this place of this beautiful natural posture without messing it up. <laughs> so the bottom line is that a horse with a balanced body and mind, but a less than perfect shape of his neck is actually much easier to train and to train to get that last little tweak of the, the neck. A horse that's balanced in his body and his mind is much more fun to ride and feels better than a horse whose neck rounds easily, but the rest of his body is a mess. So that's, in my experience and an experience riding horses, um, freestyle with, with no reins, with no bit, <laughs> with no nothing, you know, I've gotten a chance to, to feel horses in a lot of different circumstances. And I've had a lot of experience retraining um, horses that have had issues. And I would much rather have a horse who um, has self-carriage, uh, has a great mind, and maybe the neck is a little bit funny, that's easier to train, than a horse who has learned to curl up uh, in his neck, who has learned to brace in his neck, or learned to avoid the contact. That's a much harder training issue to solve. So... The more the neck is made round, when the rest of the body is not, the harder it becomes to actually get to the rest of the body. The horse has two choices, defend himself through brace or learn to avoid um, by con contracting and disappearing away from the contact. So I think this is also one of the reasons um, people get all wrapped up in this roll curl, low, deep, round, whatever you want to call it. So again, imagine that horse I described before where the back is kind of flat. And if the back is flat, probably the neck is flat. And then someone goes, oh, we need to get this horse round. And they focus on the front end and they start curling the neck. Well, the neck is flexible. So curling, the, getting the neck really round does not necessarily <laughs> connect to the rest of the horse. So people just go rounder, 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 hoping that at some point it's going to pop the back up. Now, I'm, I'm sure that there's horses that have been trained and developed to be, you know, flexible like a yoga master <laughs> maybe and can do that. But for the average horse and rider, and I'd say really most horses and riders, that's not going to get it. It's just going to disconnect, disconnect, disconnect. And now you've got a horse who's learned to disconnect his neck from the rest of the body and, and now you, it makes it harder to get to the feet. It makes it harder to control and talk to the shoulders. That's just a reality. So each of these problems, whether the horse is defending himself or curling up and avoiding, um, is exactly the opposite of what we're striving for in dressage, where we feel like we have one whole horse who's in front of the leg and reaching into the contact. But this has become such a normal way of thinking and riding that even higher level riders are going to end up solving the problem of a braced back 
by asking the horse to go deeper. Like I said, even rounder, even deeper, trying desperately to round the neck more and more in hopes that somehow they're going to end up getting on the bit and then popping the back up. So what's the alternative? It's really about priorities. So what if instead of telling students to get your horse on the bit in their first dressage lesson or in any dressage lesson, what if instructors check to see if riders could remain balanced and calm without needing the reins? That's actually one of my first priorities is self carriage. I want to make sure that the rider can ride without reins and the horse can be ridden without reins. That's one of the best ways to find out the state of the, the balance that's happening, right? So if the rider starts losing their balance because they're not holding onto the reins, well, then you know that they were balancing on the reins. And if the horse runs off faster or veers off the line of travel, then you know you're needing to use the reins too much for those things and you have less and less a chance of lightness. So checking the self-carriage is one of my top priorities. What if riders were asked to find their horse's back feet? So that's something that I'll ask my students to do if the horse is looking like they're getting disconnected or out of balance. I'll be like, I'll tell my students, feel for the horse's back feet. Tell me when you can feel your horse's back feet. And that's going to create the, a change of focus that immediately brings the rider's uh, attention to the end of the horse that we need to be thinking about, which is the hind end. That's really the, co the source of all the power, right? And the source of the balance that those hind legs are carrying more of the weight of the body. That sets up the, the possibilities for engagement and collection later. It sets up also the possibility of just being aligned Right? So I talked about in a previous episode, the alignment is what causes the back to be able to relax and stretch and be stretchable even inside collection. So in, if my students' horses are looking less than round, I'm going to be number one, checking self-carriage. Number two, ask my students to find their horse's back feet. And that might be through a transition it might be through focusing on the footfalls. It might be through seeing if I can, um, in a shoulder in, can you feel a little extra engagement? There'll be a little extra push under your, your seat. All of those things are designed to help riders think about the opposite end of the horse and to break the cycle of grabbing on those reins. Another thing that I ask my students to check is whether their horses are matching their energy. You know, the rider has an idea of how much energy they'd like from the horse. So I ask the question, is your horse matching your energy? So think about how many postures are um, going wrong <laughs> or less than ideal because the horse is going faster than what the rider wants. So they're constantly having to have a little pressure on the reins or the horse is not applying himself. You ask the horse to step up and the horse gave you like eh, 40%, <clears throat> you know? And so instead of saying, keep your leg on, keep your leg on, keep your leg on, which is just going to cause um, tightness in the rider's seat, driving in the rider's seat, which is going to cause hollowing in the back. And I mean, let's face it, that can't be comfortable for the horse to have legs driving him on all the time. So self-carriage, <laughs> can the rider feel the, the horse's back feet? And is the horse matching the energy so the rider can be in neutral and be focused on just following with the seat? If they're just following with the seat, then the seat can be light and soft and supple and flexible, which is going to increase the chance that the horse's back can come up. And what if riders were told to not restrict their horse's necks? What if in those moments of self-carriage and moments of loosening the reins, we, we got to see where the horse wants to put their neck? It's, it's going to give so much information. And also, before a horse learns how to do a movement absolutely correctly, they're going to need to recruit more muscles than they ultimately will. And 
sometimes a horse in trying to put in a big effort will use their neck simply to try to get the movement done, which ultimately we want to train out and teach them to use their core, but to develop a willingness, right? Where the horse doesn't have to be perfect. I'm going to put that in air quotes in their shape while they're trying to learn a schooling pirouette canter or something like let them lift with their neck. Ultimately, yeah, we want them to lift from carrying and from their core. But sometimes when you ask for a hard movement and the horse is really trying and they're trying with everything they can and we go, no, 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 you have to do it perfectly with your head in that place, then it just becomes hard. So I love to let the neck go, find out what's that horse been thinking the whole time. You get so much good information by checking that self-carriage and giving that length of the rein. And the information that you gain can help you then solve the problem instead of covering up the problem, which ultimately will lead to better and easier posture in the end. Now, the other thing I focus on is the quality of the communication. The shape of the horse is a result of the balance. The balance is a result of the movement. The movement is a result of the quality of the communication. And the communication is a result of the relationship. So we trace it back, right? We started with wanting a shape, but we've got to trace it back and trace it back and trace it back. And it all comes down to partnership, right? What's the posture of trust? What's the posture of willingness? What's the posture of confusion? The communication can't be, hey, horse, give me a little effort here. And the horse goes, oh, really? Do I have to? <laughs> you know, there's postures associated with that. So that's the order that I actually do things in. I start with the relationship, build the communication. Through that communication, um, I'm able to ask them to move their bodies around. Through moving their bodies around, I achieve a balance. And because of the balance, it's, well, the balance is reflected in the posture of the horse. So when I work with natural horsemanship students or students who are already signed up for being, you know, having a priority on partnership, I start at the beginning and I work my way up to doing dressage. When I work with dressage riders, I have to kind of go backwards the same way I've described it here. It's like, okay, let what do we want here? We want this, this biomechanics and then I trace it back. It's like, okay, well, it makes sense. We want to balance the horse so that he has the posture. Great. If he's out of balance, we need to be able to move some body parts back into balance. And then we look at that. Is it working? What happens when you ask your horse to move his hind end? What happens if you ask your horse to move his shoulders? What's the quality of that communication? And so we look at the communication and then through the communication, we get to see the partnership and the relationship. So either way, we're going to have to address all of these issues. It just depends on who I'm working with is which end we start at. So in the Dressage Naturally program, as I teach it, um, we, make the, we make sure first that the rider and the horse are able to calmly go stop and turn and that they can regulate their speed all without needing the reins. And this is the stage where I call it, I call it comfortable transportation. You want to just be able to get on, ride around, <laughs> and not need a lot of fancy aids just to walk, trot, and canter around the arena. And that maybe seems really simplistic, but you wouldn't, you'd be maybe surprised at how many even advanced riders and advanced horses find that difficult. And it seems like the more dressage they take, the harder the simple things become. And I don't, I don't think that necessarily should be so. <laughs> so I always want to make sure that at my base, I can drop the reins and go for a little walk, trot, canter around on my horse. When there's problems in the go, stop, turn, drop the reins and go around like comfortable transportation, there's going to be problems in the dressage. So solve the problems in the easy circumstance. And as far as rider education, if you can make sure you can go stop and turn without your reins, 
it's going to make sure that then when you do take the contact, you know you're taking the contact and you're establishing that contact. You're taking the slack out of the reins. So when I say contact, I mean you're taking the slack out of the reins until you feel the horse and that's it. That's contact. The rest is a product of, of the horse. And you're trying to set up that circumstance where the horse then fills up that contact. But if you are a rider who's been practicing not using your hands for steering or stopping or turning or yielding or hanging on, then your hands are free. Your hands are truly free to be feeling just that ingredient of connecting to the circuit of energy. So once my riders can go stop and turn, ride with no reins, go stop, turn, follow the line of travel, and regulate their speed um, without reins, then I make sure, can we take the slack out of the reins, make contact with each other, but don't take anything. There's still no taking. It's just make the contact. So the next thing we do is, is establish a conversation about stretchability. And that's where we experiment with different degrees of relaxation, different degrees of energy, different degrees of balance. And we want to make sure that we have really good communication about all of those. Because if your horse is going along like a happy little camper, and now you want him to be more biomechanically engaged and balanced and, you know, moving <clears throat> moving with the stretchable and healthy biomechanics, any adjustment you make to go from happy little camper horse to round dressage horse, you're going to be saying to the horse, you know, hey, chill out, or hey, a little more energy, or hey, can you move your shoulders or haunches here or there? <laughs> I mean, that's it. There's only three conversations. And so somewhere in the middle of a certain just right combination of relaxation, energy, and balance, there's going to be a moment where the horse goes, Ooh, I feel balanced. And they tell you that they feel balanced because then the top line can let go. And they, that's the stretchability. That's the desire to stretch. So what I teach my students is that when they feel like they're not in that mode, when the horse is not feeling stretchable and balanced and reaching for the contact, then I, I ask them to experiment. Well, it's somewhere. <laughs> there's some level of energy. There's some alignment that if you muck around enough, you're going to find it. And I promise you will find it. So those conversations are kind of like the primary colors, right? So red and blue and yellow are the primary colors. And you can mix those colors together in different combinations to make every color in the world. So that's how I use those conversations. And I teach my students to experiment the same way an artist will take a little and mix it around, see how that looks, take a little more, mix it around and see how it looks. So you're experimenting and you're feeling your horse. You're experimenting, you're feeling your horse. And that roundness comes from the mental, emotional, and physical balance that's that perfect combination. And that concept gets carried through to find the stretch. It also is carried through to find your working gates. It applies in every movement. Um, for any horse in every day, in any day, in any movement, there's a certain combination that's the sweet spot. So that means the sweet spot for a stretch. If you're doing a shoulder in, there's these little adjustments you can make to find the just right shoulder in. There's the just right canter for doing tempi changes, and that's the game. Where is it? <laughs> and what are the adjustments you need to make so that you can be a neutral and then follow it and keep the biomechanics as effortless and healthy as possible? So when I want to teach riders how to establish their working gates, right, they come for their first dressage lesson with me, and I'm not going to be saying, shorten your reins and get your horse on the bit. You're not going to hear that from me. To establish working gates, I ask riders to feel for three criteria. Would you like to know what the three criteria are? <laughs> okay, I'll tell you. 
So the three criteria for working gates are number one, the pole is the highest point. Number two, that the horse is in self-carriage. And number three, that the horse is feeling stretchable. Right? So pull the highest point. You could give the reins for a moment, put a loop in the reins and nobody falls down <laughs> or veers off course. And you have the feeling that at any moment, if I said, okay, let your horse stretch, that if you gave the reins in a stretchable way, that the horse would follow that contact down. Now that, that gets, that's going to be a subject of another podcast is how does your horse tell the difference of whether you're going to give your reins in self-carriage versus I'm giving my reins for a stretch. I'll give you a hint. It's in your own posture. So when you're able to sustain these three criteria at the same time, then you're in your working gates. And how do we know? I teach students to test it. You know, how do you know if you're in working gates? It's because stuff works. So working gates are called working gates, not because you're supposed to be working hard or the horse is supposed to be working hard. It's the, it's the scenario, it's a circumstance where stuff works, meaning it's where stuff functions. So you can think of them, maybe it's better to say the functional gates. It's like your baseline gates where you can walk, trot, canter, do transitions um, between consecutive gates and do basic figures that they're balanced and set up in a way that they can accomplish that while remaining pole high in self carriage and stretchable. So it's really time for you and your horse to enjoy the process. Way too many students are stuck in the lower levels for ever working really hard to get their horses on the bit and they don't even know that they're working against themselves one day they realize that they've taken a decade of dressage lessons and they still can't go stop or turn without with any kind of harmony they're icing their hands after their rides they have chronic back pain they're frustrated and the real trouble is they think this is normal. They think this is a normal part of dressage. It's a long suffering sport. <laughs> and the, another problem is that then their relationship with their horse is nothing like they pictured that they dreamed of when they got into horses in the first place. They're being told to tighten nose bands, put on spurs. And, you know, I've met students that I know that they cry a little on the inside when they're told to do these things. They know it doesn't feel right, but they do it because they want to be good students. And that dressage person is an expert. They buy deeper seated saddles with bigger and bigger knee rolls to hold themselves in when the horse pulls. And often they're totally confused because in the middle of these painful, pulling, rain shortening, contact grabbing moments, if the horse happens to be in a decent-ish rounded neck shape, their trainers are telling them, good! <laughs> and they know it doesn't feel good. They know it. And maybe, if you, maybe that's you if you're listening to this podcast. You've been told to tighten your horse's noseband, keep your leg on, don't let him quit, get his head down, make him round, and then you're told good when it feels horrible and you know it. And I know this sounds exaggerated, but it's not. You know, I've met so many students like this. I remember teaching at a, a dressage camp, um, one of the USDF um, adult dressage camps, and I had a student come to me with contact problems and I ran her through all these exercises and we kind of traced the logic and she had a, a regular nose van with a flash on and, um, and the horse had a lot of contact issues. It was very kind of locked in his jaw. And so I said, you know, can I, is it all right if I loosen the nose van? And she burst into tears. And so I looked at her and I said, can I just take this whole noseband off? And she just 
like sighed this big sigh and tears were streaming down her face and she said I was so scared when you came over here you were going to make me tighten the nose band and she said my trainer always wants to tighten the nose band and I know it's not my horse's fault I know he's trying to do the right thing I know I'm pulling on him but I don't understand how to get him on the bit and my trainer keeps telling me to shorten my reins and take the contact so we threw her nose band. I took it off. She threw it away. <laughs> and it was the beginning of an unwinding. It was the beginning of self-carriage. It was the, the beginning of listening to her horse and working with her horse and finding her horse's back feet. You know, dressage can be a beautiful process. You know, and I, and I know that there's instructors. There's some of you listening out there that are instructors. And hopefully you're like, amen, sister because you've been teaching it this way and you maybe thought you were weird. You're not weird. You're doing it. You're doing it right. If you're finding different ways to explain how to create the trust and the partnership and the balance with your horses and your students and your riders and your, you know, keep going. <laughs> we need more like you. If we stop trying to get a horse on the bleeping bit, and just know that the horses will get there when they're ready. If we don't try to make a horse look round, if it doesn't feel round, we're going to be getting closer to our target and our real goal. You know, dressage is really about riding a horse who is and feels balanced and in harmony with you. Aim for that and the posture the posture just works itself out so much more easily. If you'd like to see examples of this kind of training, I have lots and lots of videos. Uh, if you're listening to this somewhere other than my website, go to dressagenaturally.net slash podcast and on, find this episode and I'll have links to different resources uh, my book and some videos in my video classroom that you can look up and you can really see this in process with me and my horses. And you can also see how I work with students um, in this process. Thank you for listening.